Hi, everyone. Dr. Tim and Hillary for another Dr. Tim's podcast. And today we're doing something a little different. This I'm giving a talk or I'm giving you a talk that I've given uh, to actually the zebrafish workshop that I've been helping out at at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And I thought this might be interesting, tipping our toes and maybe falling down a little bit of a rabbit hole. But we get a lot of requests for more <laughs> rabbit holes. So you asked for it. You're going to make a lot of people really happy with this. Okay. So, uh, and, and what's, you know, usually I don't know the questions that Hillary answers. Well, we've turned the tables today and Hillary's never even seen this talk. So she doesn't know what's coming. Um, so she can ask questions or if I do say something or have a slide here that isn't uh, clear, she can help clarify that. All right. So All right. talk is a nitrifier is not a nitrifier is not a nitrifier. An update on who's who in nitrification in aquatic systems. And what this it talk is, it's some history of nitrifying bacteria in aquatic systems, why some people uh, think uh, it's still Nitrobacter, Nitrosomonas, and the, and the techniques. Because science, the neat thing about science, some would say the not no neat, neat thing, but if you're a true scientist, you build on the work of others Negative results are results. My first paper that I published, peer-reviewed paper, was a negative result. It was I used all this technique and I couldn't find nitrobacter and nitrosomonas. That's a result. So we're going to go through the history, the techniques, and things like that. And uh, let's get started. Well, there's a little biography I give. So for those who don't know, I did my bachelor's at San Diego State. In the middle of that, spent a year studying limnology in Sweden, University of Uppsala, uh, Sweden, in Swedish. Quite fun. Did my master's on ammonia toxicity and ammonia excretion in striped bass. I was working at a striped bass farm running the hatchery um, at different temperatures and feeding rates. PhD was uh, phylogenetics, a nitrifying bacteria in aquaria and mono lake, because the professor I was doing, who was my chair, ran, run Snarl, the Sierra Nevada aquatic research lab up in Mono Lake. And most of the time I spent with him discussing my dissertation was on the chairlifts as we went up to then ski down. Um, hey, you got to have some fun, right? Uh, <laughs> at, at Mammoth Mountain. Hillary, stop laughing. At Mammoth Mountain. That's a true story. We spent a lot of time on chairlifts talking about research and what I was doing and things like that. Haven't really had too many jobs. USP score between the bachelor's and master's was in the Philippines raising milkfish and shrimp. And then uh, aquaculture, aquatic systems, raising hybrid striped bass, marine land aquarium products, and then Dr. Tim's. Um, that's a short biography of me. Traditional view of nitrification. Ammonia, and a lot of places write ammonium, NH4. It is ammonia unionized. That is what can go through the cell wall. That is what goes through the gill tissue in the fish, which is why ammonia is more toxic at higher pHs because the higher percentage of the total ammonia is in the gaseous or NH3 form. Nitri ammonia is converted to nitrite, and that's done by Nitrosomonas europea. And then nitrite is converted to nitrate and that is done by Nitrobacter Winogretzky. If you can, if you know this diagram, per, can halfway pronounce the words, you went from novice to um, semi-advanced aquarist. And I firmly believe this. I believe this when I started my PhD. This was um, what I went after. I wanted to use molecular techniques to identify. My background is in community college ecology. You know, you can count zooplankton, you can count fish, you can see them. How can we count, enumerate these bacteria and figure out where they live? And Nitrosomonas europea, Nitrobacter winogratzky, that's it. Bacteria, and, and a lot of people will say, well, it doesn't really matter. You know, bacteria are bacteria. It's fresh water, salt water, cold water, warm water, pH, nothing matters. These are the bacteria and bacteria, bacteria, and who cares? That is a very simplistic view. Uh, 
bacteria have niches. And there are a lot of nitrifiers, but depending upon the conditions. So this this simpleton tech uh thinking is just plain wrong. Bacteria are really complex. In fact, I could uh, debate they're more complex than humans in some aspects. Bacteria mostly look alike, and that's part, that's part of the problem. There aren't a lot of shapes. You know, these are the different shapes, the staphylococci, rods, maybe some uh, spiral like nitrospira because it has a spiral shape. Um, and it's hard to tell one from the other because they don't have a lot of colors either. You know, it's not like colorful freshwater or saltwater fish. Don't let that think that these are simple organisms. They're not. Their physiology can be quite complex. Uh, I mean, look look at fish. This is just different fish shapes, huge amount, which we can see the fish. We really can't see the bacteria. So we tend to... W- Humans want to categorize things. And since bacteria look alike, they must all pretty much be the same. And that's wrong thinking. Bacteria are small. I mean, this is a 1200X. And yeah, how many species are there? Who knows? Uh, You can't really tell anything. It looks kind of like a blob. So Okay, I've got a a question. (laughs) for each of these little dots, if you will, is that an individual bacteria or multiple bacteria? Uh, that's individual bacteria. I, I, I should say, like, I, I'm asking questions. Bacterium. So if you're listening to this on the podcast, maybe hop over to YouTube and watch this one because there's a lot of visuals that are going along with what he's talking yes, about. Yes, this is a, this is out of the ordinary. It's very visual um, talk today. But it, I think it, it it's important. So what you're seeing is just some reddish and blue purple dots on a white background looks like a slide it is a slide uh can't really distinguish much because as as i said humans like to classify everything the original you probably learned it in school and that's what i'm showing here is the, is the five kingdoms you know there were the prokaryotes which which are bacteria and cyanobacteria there were uh, fungi, the plants, the animals, and then this uh, catch-all uh, group. Those, those were the five kingdoms. And, you know, you, where do you throw viruses? Yeah, you know, there's always an exception to that. And that's kind of what everybody learned for a long, long time. But again, it was hard. Where do you throw these things? How do they relate these things? How do you do the ecology and the evolution with this? And so it wasn't perfect, but it was a framework. And so you then you had eukaryotes. So you you had prokaryotes, which are bacteria, cyanobacteria, basically single-celled organism. And eukaryotes are the multi-celled or, organisms like plants and animals and fungus and stuff like that. To start on the nitrification, let's go back. We're going to go back into history. And up on there is a picture of Sergei Wanogratsky. And this is from the 1880s. And he was a Ukrainian microbiologist. And he was he discovered uh, chemoautotrophy and what Chemo, you got to remember all this was kind of in German and Russian where they take lots of words and string it in together into one word. So chemo, chemical, and autotrophy means to growth. And basically nitrifiers are chemo autotrophs in that they get their energy from the oxidation. Converting that ammonia to nitrite yields a little, and I mean a little energy. Converting nitrite to nitrate yields even less energy, but some energy. And that's how these organisms power themselves by these chemical reactions inside the cell. And that is called chemoautotroph. Um, and he, you know, was really the first microbial ecologist, which if you had to classify me, I'm, you know, an aquatic microbial ecologist, where you're looking not just at the organism, but how it relates to its environment, how energy flows through it and from it, who eats it, how it affects the entire community. And that's really what ecology is, is looking at the overall community. And for years and years, 
bacteria were just a black box. They were too difficult to study. So we're going to put them over to the side here and we're going to study the bigger things, the zooplankton and the fish and the invertebrates. And we're just going to realize the bacteria are too tough. And that's going to change here in this talk. And basically, he was the first person to show that the bacteria were responsible of the conversion of ammonia to nitrite and nitrite to nitrate, what we call nitrification. And he discovered nitrosomonas and he discovered nitrobacter. These, this is in the 1880s. This is like 140 years ago, a no, long time ago. Um, and this came through what's called the Wino-Gratzky column. So up here I'm showing, and you still use this in microbial ecology classes, you can take a, a you know, clear column, one, three, four inch diameter, and you put soil in it, and over the soil you put water, and then you let you let it percolate. And over time, what's going to happen is you're going to get all these different colors in the column, in, in the substrate, the soil, above the substrate, and it's almost all microbial processes as, and we've talked about this, in the upper layer, you have oxygen. As you go through the sediment, the oxygen is, is removed, and so you get an anaerobic zone, and then finally you get an anoxic zone. And it's all caused by bacterial processes. If you've been out messing around, you know, in a lagoon, a lake, or something, and you squish your feet into that deep sediment and it comes up and it's all black and it stinks. That's the anoxic zone, which is producing nothing but hydrogen sulfide. And through experimenting and isolating from these Wynogradsky columns, he was able to show that it was microbial processes that were responsible for the changes that you could observe. And then a little bit of uh, microbiology 101 here. You have lots of, everybody looks at Petri dishes. You see it all the time. It's kind of the standard, um, you know, motif of microbiology. And they even have cont art contests of making bacteria art on Petri dishes. Um, and the problem is, and if you took any type of microbiology course, you know, in the 1900s, even recently, it was all about culture media. You had an unknown back, uh, unknown sample that they'd give you, and you had to plate it out on these Petri dishes and try to isolate, determine what it is. The problem with that is, and then you infer, you think, well, it did this or it grew on this, so it must be this type of bug. But the problem with that is we are really bad at growing bacteria. We can count through a stain, it's called a DAPI or, or AO, acridine orange stain or different um, stains. We can count how many bacteria are in a sample, a drop of seawater, a drop of lake water. But then when we take that same drop and try to culture it, we get orders of magnitude, like one or two or 3% is all we can do because we don't know. We, we don't know what they need. And we don't have the media, the culture media to grow all those bacteria. And this is called culture dependent methods. All our microbial ecology and all the relationships that we formed or thought were formed around microbiology were all done based on culturing. And this can only take you so far and leaves out heaps of bacteria because we didn't even know what they are. And that's called culture bias. You know, you can only grow what you grow, but that doesn't mean that your culture actually accurately represents what's there. And as an ecologist, it's like, well, I'm going to study the savanna, but I'm going to take all the elephants out of it. So I'm not going to, you know, I didn't even know they exist because I can't grow them. I can't see them. And that's the same here with the bacteria, but it's much, much harder. So the identification, culture bias is the identification of microorganisms by culturing. We assume what we end up with in the culture is what represents the natural environment. But in reality, as I said, we can only grow a half to 5% of the microorganisms that are in the sample. So the media is biasing the results. 
And there's a handbook. You know, you, if you're going to go s- grow bacteria, you go to this handbook, and it tells you what media, what what do you need to prepare chemicals to grow your target bacteria. And the problem with that is that when you go to these handbooks and you go to this place called ATC American type culture cell culture that you can get samples of bacteria they're telling you how you know what media that you need to grow the bacteria in and how this relates to nitrifiers is that for nitrous ammonis it was a very high amount of ammonia nobody nobody ever grew nit- you know ammonia oxidizers at the ammonia levels that are in aquariums, which are much, much lower. The ammonia levels in this ammonia culturing media would kill all your fish within you know hours. But what that led to is that when you came, use this culture method or this media and you took samples, invariably you got nitrous ammonia europea. And so that's that what it, that's has to be there. We always get this. That was the bias. The the fact is, if you flash forward a little bit, at these high ammonia values, nitrous ammonia europea is the one that outcompetes everybody and grows. But that doesn't mean that in the natural environment, that's what's there. you're, You're basically having ammonia at 800 milligrams per liter. Our aquariums don't have eight, much less 800. And the same with nitrite. It was you know a couple hundred milligrams per liter nitrite. Those are just way out of reality for aquariums. And so basically, as I said, it's just self-reinforcement. The formula always grew these bacteria because those are the bacteria that can only grow at those high ammonia and high nitrite concentrations. And so that's what you have to think about when you're designing an experiment or you're looking at things, did my experimental design cause the result or is the result actually representative of what's happening in nature? And, you know, everybody has biases, but when you're trying to do an experiment, you're trying to be uh, culture or bias free. So up on the screen here, we have a diagram I've come up with, and it shows kind of the classical two-step nitrification that we just talked about. You had these ammonia oxidizers, and they converted the ammonia to, and this is nitrous ammonia europea, uh, ammonia oxidizing bacteria, short for AOB, um, that would convert ammonia to nitrite, and it was nitrobacter that then converted that nitrite to nitrate. And there's the classical two-step. You need these two bacteria to do this. But then we have this new paradigm. People were thinking about this, and it it wasn't like Wino Gratsky. He knew. He, He knew that his results were biased, but he didn't know how to make, you know, and he strived to make them as unbiased as he could. But when, you know, how did you do that? How could you do that? And so, so microbiologists knew we needed a culture independent. It, you could take a sample right from the wild. You know, run a, a gill net and grab the fish that are there. Go out in the savanna, hide yourself, and wait and see all the animals that are there. We needed a culture independent method for bacteria. And we needed a method that didn't have bias. It didn't promote one type of bacterium over another. It just gave you a snapshot of the environment that as it it was at your sampling time. And this became what's called phylogenetic taxonomy, taxonomy. And phylogenetics is based on, in this case, the 16S ribosomal RNA. So up on the screen is a picture of the genetic sequence of the 16S R ribosomal RNA. Every extent, every living organism has this molecule. It's, it's part of the replication structure. And what's cool about this molecule is there are sequences 
of this that the the order of the a the c the t the g are exactly the same in every organism and as you go from you know kingdom to family to phylum what you can what you find is that there are places in this structure that are all the same say for bacteria versus or certain types of bacteria and and basically you can look at this sequence and down get down to where the base pairs are different just at the species level and uh I'll try to take this slowly a little bit. So all extent, all living organisms carry the 16S RNA gene. You can design what are called universal probes. So there's areas here where every organism has it. So you can use DNA probing and you can look at the domain. You can look at the family, the genus, and then finally get down to species level where and I'll jump ahead, like a nitro, uh, a nitrospira, one type of nitrospira will vary just for maybe 10 or 11 of these base pairs versus another one. And you can design sequences and through some, some chemistry tag these. And this is, this is basically what I did for my PhD. I sequenced or the the DNA here, and then the this gene. I didn't sequence the gene; it was sequenced. What I went through is I developed probes and tested them on pure cultures to find out where in the Nitrobacter winogradsky and the Nitrosomonas europaea it was specific for that species. So then you can go into the your sample, be it an aquarium or Mono Lake or anywhere. And grab your sample, and through some some chemistry, you can find out whether that organism are, is present or absent. And when I was doing this, you actually labeled these uh, DNA probes with uh, radioactive phosphorus. So it was quite fun. Nowadays, you can do it with uh, signaling probes. It's it's a little safer. Um, and and so when you started looking at this. Instead of these five or six kingdoms, the eukaryotes, the archaea, the proteus, plants, fungi, and animals, you could classify these basically into three domains. And this was the work of Carl Woes. And he found that you could go above the kingdoms of life into the domains, and he discovered this brand new domain called the archaea. And it was always these weird organisms that kind of didn't fit. But based on looking at the 16S RNA, found that there's bacteria, there's archaea, and then there's the eukaryotes. Now, initially, when he came up with this work, you know, people were saying, no, this is wrong. This can't be. This is not what's happening. You know, biology is humans and humans are hard to change. They don't, they resist change. And uh, it, he, he didn't get a lot of support when he initially uh, started looking at this. And up on the picture is Carl Woes. He's an American biologist, microbiologist out of Illinois. And he, his whole thing was championing archaea as this whole new kingdom of life. And his work changed the course of microbiology and directly uh, into the you know nitrification and and night and nitrifiers and who's in these different environments all f- flowed the work I did flowed from the work that that he did and so now you can come up with these phylogenetic trees and these are relationships based on RNA not based on how something looks you know there's there's a lot of misidentification that happened in, in the fish world. Because, especially in some species of marine fish, the female looks completely different than the male. And people, oh, that's two different species. No, 
they're the exact same species. They're the female and male, but people were looking at colors. They were looking at what our eyes could see, not looking at the DNA. And phylogenetics looks at the DNA and has and is caused a whole different outlook of how relationships are between not only bacteria, but fish. V very famous fish group that this has been used on are the cichlids in Lake Tanganyika and how they relate because you can actually look at what's called a molecular clock. Organisms, the DNA changes at a pretty known rate. And so if the DNA of two organisms is close, you know that they evolved close together. If it's the DNA is quite different, then you know that there's a time span between them. And, and we're not going to go down that deep rabbit hole, but there was a lot of data that you can get from this type of phylogenetic information. So that when I talk about this or you see these phylogenetic trees, this is what it's all based upon. And so the phylogenetics of nitro fires, what's up here is a screen from my first paper uh, published um, in uh, Applied Environmental Microbiology. You know, I did my PhD at UC Santa Barbara. And basically in the biology department or the e e ecology, evolution, and marine biology department, um, you needed to get at least two papers published in a peer-reviewed journal to have to be able to graduate there's pretty much a requirement there. Um, you know, you're doing original research. And what I did is I looked and developed these molecular probes looking for nitrobacter in one group and then the um, nitrifiers and ammonia oxidizers in another. So I was able to split out the ammonia oxidizers from the nitrite oxidizers um, with these different probes. And then I can take these to samples and what's on the screen now is that uh, this is old technology. It's called slot blotting. You took these samples, you you uh, uh, would would capture the DNA or extract the DNA of the sample, which took a lot of work. Bacteria cells are hard to break open. You'd have some SDS at a high temperature and a bead beater to break open the cell, purify the DNA, and then you would expose it to these probes. And you'd have controls. And so what you can see here is that you you have a, a section on the upper right and you have these little uh, slots or dashes. Yeah, well, the bigger the fuzz, the more stuff, the more radioactive. But, but what that shows is that there are bacteria. That's a positive. So that's a universal bacterial probe. It's a probe for you bacteria. So I know my samples, it's a three by a one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's 21 samples there. They're all this black blot. And that says you've got bacteria in your sample. Well, the next one over is the general night ammonia oxidizer probe, but those are all my controls. The controls are lighting up five out of the 21. All the other samples are blank. And then down in the lower left, there's another slot blot, and it's for uh, the bacteria. Let me go back. You can see this, uh, the little dark box over here. So there's a general probe for a bunch of ammonia oxidizers, and then there's a ammonia oxidizing probe, which just goes after this Nitrococcus and Nitrosomonas europea probe. And so when the slot plot looks, you can see my test, you know, number 6A and 6 or 7A here, that's my samples of pure nitrosomonas and nitrosococcus, and they light up. So the probe works for those, but everything else is blank. And then over on the bottom right in the upper part, you can see there's two slot plots, and those are my probes that are for the nitrobacter, and they're lit up. You, you can see the blot there, but the samples are empty. So what this says is that I successfully was able to extract DNA from samples. I was able to, on pure samples of either nitrosomonas or nitrobacter, my probes were working, but all those other areas are blank. And that is means that those bacteria were not in those samples. 
which came from aquariums. This was a completely uh, complete surprise. This was the negative result I was telling you. And so the professor I was working with said, you know, you got two choices. You're not a very good microbiologist because I was new. He was training me. Um, or those organisms aren't in those aquarium samples. Well, I knew my techniques were good. So it had to be B, those bacteria, Nitrobacter, Nitrosomonas, weren't in the aquarium samples. And that's when my PhD took a big giant left turn to figure out who's in those blank spots. Fast forward, the techniques got a little better, and the uh, professor I was working with developed a technique called FISH, fluorescent in situ hybridization. So instead of using radioactive labels, you could use these probes which had fluorochromes on there, and you could color the samples different. So on this slide here, this is actually a, a you know picture I took with an epifluorescent uh, microscope. The green, and it's fuzzy. So now here, Hillary, you see these this fuzziness and inside there. That's the ammonia oxidizers in green and the nitrite oxidizers in red. I jumped about two and a half years of research ahead here. And the fuzziness is because nitrifiers grow as groups and they grow in nitro in, in biofilms. They don't grow as single-celled organisms that look like a bunch of hot dogs growing on top of each other. That's not nitrifiers. Um, so using these RNA database and these probes I developed that are culture independent, I was able to come up with a method to identify nitrifiers. And through isolation and purification, was able to show these different relationships and nitrifiers turn out to be very diverse. They're, in, they're all over the place and they have niches that they grow in and preferences that they have. And the big part of this, and I stress this a lot when you're cycling, is that the aquarium nitrifying bacteria do not grow well at high concentrations. And we're talking like 10 milligrams per liter. That's why I always say, try to keep your ammonia and your nitrite low, less than five milligrams per liter nitrogen, because that's where the target organisms are. And all that sampling I did came from aquariums. I didn't go out someplace like the sewage treatment plant um, to isolate the bacteria. I went to aquariums because that's what we're dealing with is the aquarium environment. So long story short, it turns out that the ammonia oxidizing bacteria are nitrosomonas asteri-like and nitrosomonas halophilia-like. So salt-loving or originally was from a estuary. And the big discovery was nitrospira. At the time of my work, there was only one representative of the nitrospira group. It only grew at like 37 Celsius uh, and higher, you know, and it was isolated. It was called Nitrospira moscoviensis because it was isolated from a heating pipe in uh, Moscow. Uh, but it turned out that in aquarium environments and many other aquatic environments, especially where there's very little nitrite, uh, present so low concentration, it's this nitrospire group of organisms that's doing the oxidation. Now, a lot of people and a lot of and a couple of companies, you know, didn't like that result, but the science is the science, and that's uh, been shown. So now we can look at this and we can take that two step classification and change it from you know, we still have our ammonia oxidizing bacteria, but the nitrite oxidizing bacteria is now nitrospira. So we've we've made a discovery and we're good. Well, not so fast. Because then a few years later, a paper came out and it showed what's called aminox. So this was an anaerobic ammonia oxidizing bacteria. Now, if you remember, I've always talked about how the ammonia oxidizing bacteria have to have oxygen. But it was always theorized that you could have an anaerobic ammonia oxidizing bacteria, which very 
characteristic I'm showing a reactor here with these with these uh, bacteria and it's kind of a reddish purple. The environment is anaerobic, so very low oxygen, and it's able to take ammonia and combines it with nitrite to go right to nitrogen gas. The issue is that it produces hydrazine as an intermediate. Hydrogen is rocket fuel. It's also very poisonous to lots of different organisms, and it grows really slow. You know, I talk about the growth of ammonia bacteria, ammonia oxidizing bacteria, nitrite oxidizing bacteria is like a day. You know, these guys, their doubling time is seven to 22 days. So it's interesting. And it was actually found in a marine recirculating aquaculture system. Well, how did that be? anaerobic but you have to remember i think i've shown talked i know i've talked about this when you're talking microbiology you're talking on very small scales and there are areas in all aquariums and all aquaculture systems where organics pile up just like those uh Wynogratsky columns where once you get organics piled up over a substrate the bacteria in the top of that organic pile is consuming oxygen, so the internal part becomes less oxygen or anaerobic, and you can get these processes. So they, they can occur. Then, and, and I just showed a, a picture of a, a, re a reactor growing these uh, planktomyces. It's pretty cruddy looking, but it, it it can definitely grow and it can definitely have a process to get rid of ammonia in an anaerobic environment, which which there are plenty. There's ammonia is produced when organics are broken down. And so if you have uh, waste farms and things like that, these organisms can grow quite well and they have industry industrial size reactors that grow these organisms because the water is anaerobic is that what i'm looking at right now as a reactor yeah that's a bio wheel if you remember oh. that's a, that we go back that is a we see that disc turns you over here on the left you've got the the mechanisms that's turning this disc through the water and then you can see they've scraped off a little bit i'll go into close-up they've scraped off a little bit to show you the metal disc and all that grime crud snot whatever you want to talk about, that is the Aminox bacteria. Because this is, uh, if you're raising hogs and cows and different animals, you're not allowed in Europe to discharge that water into a lake or a stream. You have to treat it. And that's where this work is. Uh, because that water is very high in organics, which means you're growing lots of heterotrophic organisms, right? And what are those heterotrophic organisms doing? Everybody should know this, right? They're consuming oxygen and they're producing ammonia when it got to get rid of this ammonia. And what would traditionally happen in ammonia is you produce nitrate. Well, you don't want to put the nitrate in the water either because that can lead to algae blooms. So by growing this organism, I went through it a little pretty fast, but by growing this organism, you're actually producing nitrogen gas which goes out into the atmosphere, which is 76% nitrogen. So you end up with no nitrogen waste. You don't have ammonia or nitrate going into the waste stream. So you're not polluting the stream, the ocean, the lake, or anything like that. Moving on. So now with, with these techniques, we, we have this group, a suite of tools to start looking at where ammonia oxidizers are and things like that. Another paper came out, and this is pretty cool because this is the first time that ammonia oxidizing archaea were isolated. We talk about ammonia oxidizing bacteria, the nitrosomonas, nitrosococcus, and things like that. Remember, I talked about how Carl Woe showed that the archaea are as different to bacteria as bacteria are to prokaryotes or eukaryotes, not the same prokaryotes. Thanks, sorry, get confused. That's the same thing here. And what's cool is these ammonia oxidizing archaea were isolated from aquariums. They're isolated from the Shedd Aquarium and from the Seattle Aquarium. And these 
are normally the archaea once once the work of woes is accepted then it became well yeah they're there but they're extremophiles they only live in these really weird environments not the normal environments well that's not true uh they live in they live in aquariums and they were able to isolate these ammonia oxidizing archaea from some saltwater aquariums then uh even f- further is this uh japanese researcher who's now a professor here in the states found that when you go below 10 degrees celsius or 50 degrees fahrenheit the dominant ammonia oxidizing organism is not aob but it's aoas ammonia oxidizing archaea dominate at colder temperatures and every you know there were always issues even with the cultures that i grew they didn't work at this very at these cold temperatures and the thinking was well you know it's just too cold for the process no it's the wrong organism again where was this isolated from it was isolated from saltwater aquariums and public aquariums in japan then uh people started looking at the what's called the stoichiometric I mean, how how fast do these organisms these this these crinarch oak crin archaea grow in aquariums and you can look at ammonia consumption nitrite production and things like that and what they found was that in the aquarium environment the archaea were inhibited by very small amounts of dissolved organics you know, and aquariums typically have high levels of dissolved organics. So, again, you're, if you're trying to grow this organism, but you have high levels of organics, then you're basically retarding its growth. So you don't maybe count it there. So things are starting to get complex. But again, all this work is being done in fish culture systems. So now we're back to our diagram here. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so you're talking about the different public aquariums that some of these samples have come from. And you mentioned the Seattle Aquarium and the Shed. And some places get their water for the aquariums directly from the ocean. I think Seattle is one of them. I know the Shed used to way back in the beginning. Does that matter? Would the bacteria that you find in the aquarium, would the bacteria that are found in the wild eventually make their way into the public aquarium? even if it was completely closed and not taking water from the ocean? It's a good question. And I don't think there's an answer to that yet. Obviously you could design the experiment, but I don't think like Monterey has looked at the bacterial uh, biome of the water coming in and then how that looks uh, in their biofilters. I would think that what they would be a little bit different because the water coming in from the aquarium, from the ocean is going to have a, uh, probably a wide variety, a lot of diversity. And in the aquarium, the environment doesn't really change a lot. And I think you're going to lose that diversity in a couple of, uh, you know, a lot fewer species would dominate. But that's just my guess. But I mean, are are these organisms in the ocean? The answer is yes. That is generally how your aquarium gets seeded. And I did this experiment where we took set up aquariums and we filtered the water through a 0.2 micron filter, which basically removes all the bacteria. And we, we autoclaved all the rock, the decorations and everything. So it's basically a sterile environment adding sterile water. And then we also set up aquariums side by side with that same water that wasn't sterilized. And this was just dechlorine, you know, tap water run through activated carbon. And the aquariums that were sterilized, as you might expect, they took forever to cycle because you have to get your seed stock from somewhere, right? I mean, the back, it, it, the bacteria have to come from some, someplace. And basically, for most aquariums, it's coming from your tap water. Your RODI unit is, is a decent filter, but it's not a microbial filter. 
So now we've got our diagram up here and we've got another player. We've got ammonia oxidizing bacteria and ammonia oxidizing archaea, which are, you know, oxidizing ammonia, obviously, into nitrite. And then we've got the nitrospira that's oxidizing the nitrite into nitrate. And whether it's AOBs or AOAs that are dominant really depends upon temperature and the environment. There's been some studies and it's, I don't have a conclusive answer. I would say that if someone said you had to come up with an answer, I think in the beginning, when you first set up your tank, your your AOBs dominate because they grow faster, they become established. And then over time, if you keep the tank clean and you have low organics, the AOAs may, the ammonia oxidized in archaea may tend to dominate. We don't have a conclusive study for that answer, but I, I think that's what's happening is just like in most ecological systems, which your aquarium is, you have your R and your K, your colonizing species, and then eventually they lose out to the, the slower growing but more dominant species that take over. Then, okay, so we got it. We got two types of ammonia oxidizers and we got nitrospira. Let's get back to looking at our fish. Well, that's not the end of the story, folks. So in 2015 or so, an organism was found that basically, and they call it Cominox, because it goes from ammonia. One organism is able to take ammonia through nitrite right to nitrate. Not, not two-step, not two bacteria or two, you know, AOA and a, and a nitrospire. Nope, one organism. And so that's a spin, single organism belonging to the nitrospira. The nitrospira turn out to be very diverse and very old. They're found in the bot, the subterranean trenches. If you've seen the, the steam trenches out at the Galapagos and other places full of nitrospira. Nitrospira turn out to be a very old group of bacteria that have been split into different lineages and things like that. And this group, two groups simultaneously published that their results showing that this single organism could take ammonia right to nitrate, which is pretty cool. And so here's, here's the different groups published in nature. It doesn't get much better than publishing your results in nature. Um, and, uh, you know, complete nitrification by a single mi microorganism. Also, they found this in fish systems. So, so now, is it one or two-step nitrification? We've got a, a different bug here, a different nitrospira that takes ammonia right to nitrate, common X. So I've added that to our diagram here. Have I blown your mind yet, Hillary? Yes, but, <laughs> but, but the thought... Like that was in what you said, 2015, like what's yeah. going to happen in 2025? Like, what are we going to find? What else are we going to learn and know? Well, exactly. That's what's so much fun is that when, you know, people are stuck in the 1950s or 60s. And what's really cool about this whole thing is that all this work was done in aquariums, which I just find fascinating that, you know, wasn't done some crazy, you know, didn't have to get on a ship and go out in the middle of the ocean somewhere Basically, all this work on nitrif nitrification, identifying the processes, isolating the microorganisms was done on aquariums and aqu aquaculture systems. So you end up with the AOAs and the AOBs and the nitrospira and the one-step nitrospira. It's a lot more diverse, which just makes sense. The world is diverse. The, the conditions are diverse. It's this thinking that it's one group of organisms, Nitrobacter, Nitrosomonas, is, is just wrong. And we know that. And you have to look at the systems and the, the environment to figure out which of these bacteria might dominate or organisms might dominate. So the current views of nitrification are you've got, you know, this Nitrosomonas marina oxidizes ammonia to nitrite. 
nitrite to nitrate is nitrospira, and that is generally in systems that have a lot of organics, higher levels of uh, ammonium nitrite. And then the AOA are in certain systems or or once the system is matured. You know, it's, it's interesting, and I don't think anybody's done this, Hillary, is looking at the biome in a tank that's new and then what about three months, six months, a year, 18 months? How does that change? And I, you're, I think you're going to find that it does change. Again, you've got the AOA and the nitrospira, and then you've got ammonia going right to nitrate with the, with another subclass of nitrospira. And then if you have a lot of organic in, uh, uh, anaerobic zones, you're going to find this planktomyces, ammonia, nitrite, right to ni- nitrogen gas, with the planktomyces. So I gave gave this talk not so much for you know home aquariums, but for more professionals, because in a lot of aquaculture systems, you can have high levels of organics, or you can combine that with uh, hydroponics or aquaponics where you're growing vegetables and things like that. And you really need to think about what your culture system is, depend, and that will tell you most likely what the microorganisms are in that system. And then, you know, if you look at this recent paper, 2020 was looking at salinities because that's the biggest thing. People ask just the same bacteria. And I showed this a long time ago, uh, but I get a lot of pushback because people say, well, you're just trying to sell different types of bacteria. So this is a paper out of a German research group in aquaculture engineering. You have a Venn diagram here. And what they looked at is biofilters from freshwater, brackish, and marine RAS is recirculating you know, aquaculture systems. And where that comes together, where it shows 270 taxonomic units shared. So there's a great diversity. You know, the brackish had 30, almost 4,000 different taxonomic units. And you can see through this Venn diagram that there's a lot of diversity in these systems just based on salinity. So salinity has the greatest overall effect on nitrifiers. And as you increase salinity, you're probably switching from, definitely switching more to the ammonia oxidizing bacteria versus the ammonia oxidizing archaea. Nitrospire dominates for all the um, uh, nitrite oxidizing organisms because I talked about that single nitrospira that can convert. As of yet, that is only found in freshwater systems. They haven't been able to isolate that in a marine system. But in our podcast, Hillary, we don't discriminate against freshwater people because those aquariums are just as nice as (laughs) saltwater. I, I feel like you're very much a freshwater person. I'm not, I don't know if I'm very much, but I can, I mean, we. How, how many of the I, tanks at your office are freshwater versus saltwater? I don't have to answer those questions. <laughs> not Hillary's just podcast. Saying. It's, it's, my, it's Dr. Tim's <laughs> and Hillary's podcast. Anyways, if you saw, they had the landscaping contest at Aquashella last week. And those those are beautiful. You can yes. yeah, they, were, they were gorgeous. They were I would gorgeous. love to have one of those tanks in my house just to watch. I don't want to maintain it. Yeah, I was gonna say I want someone to come and take care of it all. So but they're so peaceful and relaxing. They, they were they were great. Um and and as I've said for a long time, and when people email us, if you have our salt water or reef one and only it'll work in fresh water if you have the fresh water version it doesn't work in salt water which is kind of weird people wouldn't you know microbiologists generally think it was the opposite that the fresh water bacteria would have a greater salinity range than the salt water but that's not the case and that's what these researchers found you know 20 some years after i published uh, these results, but uh, so the the marine bacteria. If you're running a brackish water tank, you want to go with the marine nitrifiers. They have the greatest uh, salinity tolerance or or range. And uh, the Cominex, this is the one um, nitrospire that goes right from ammonia to nitrite. 
They found it in some brackish water, but full strength seawater hasn't been detected yet. So this is a diagram that kind of gives you an idea of all these organisms I've been talking about, you know, the, the, uh, in here, this sums it up. And basically, depending freshwater recirculating, saltwater recirculating, hydroponics, aquaponics, in di varying degrees, all these organisms have been found, except the common ox has not been found yet in marine. I said yet. I'm sure it'll show up. Um, but it's just not a dominant uh, player in the role of nitrification in marine recirculating systems. So general conclusions, what I've been, you know, down this rabbit hole, it's come up for oxygen, get, get aerobic. You know, basically there are distinct differences between freshwater and marine nitrifying communities. There just is, folks. People tell you there isn't, they don't know what they're talking about. Nitrifying organisms, which ones dominate in aquaponics, hydroponics, it depends upon many, many factors. You can't say that just one does. Um, the research is pretty conclusive that in recirculating aquaculture systems, RAS, which, which I want to make sure you understand this, are different than home aquariums. Because recirculating aquaculture systems generally have a lot more organics. And in these systems, the proteobacteria, the AOBs, are the dominant ammonia oxidizing organism. Does that mean that the AOBs are the dominant ammonia oxidizing organisms in home aquariums? No. That research... I mean, the research I've done shows that that they are, but I mean, there could there's more to be done. I didn't look at all different things, um, but recirculating aquaculture systems tend to have a lot higher organic levels than your home aquarium because nobody worries about the water being crystal clear. Gominex dominates in low steady system, very mature systems with low organics in that are fresh water. How important is aminox? You know, in culture systems, uh, probably not that important, but not completely no. So the future is micro microbiome uh, analysis, you know, really being able to look at these techniques. The molecular probes, uh, you had to design a probe for each organism, test it and things like that better than the culture dependent methods but now it's not that expensive to basically do a whole biome study of a sample and start looking at what's there and what densities are and things like that. Now, just because you find it doesn't tell you what the phys phys physiological process is, but you can get a pretty good, pretty good guess on some of these. So some references. And I'll take uh, questions from my audience of one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyways, I hope, uh, you know, we, we won't do this too often, but unless people want it, but uh, we, we do get this and, and I do give talks uh, around the world at aquaculture and zebrafish and, you know, different conferences. And uh, I thought people might enjoy that most of this research on nitrifiers was all done from aquariums. It's pretty cool. That is pretty interesting. No. Okay, I have one question. Sure. What's the next area of research that you're going to look into? Because it sounds like there's a whole lot of different stuff that's possible and the different ways that you go. Are you done doing research? No, no, no. Uh, we We are not done. I don't want to say that. Um, you know, we still have a lot of, of organics. Uh, um, I, I really would like to figure out if there's some way, you know, we get it all, all the time at this shows, Hillary, dinoflagellate cyanobacteria. And I have, I've gone through what I think. Is there some way, can you control that environment? Can you, can you, can you come up with something that, keeps it in more of the good bacteria versus getting the cyanos and the dinos. 
Um, it's that's it's all biology, chemistry related. Could we do something like that? Um, the biome, you know, the problem with biome is you can identify who's there, but as I stated in the first couple of slides, we can only grow 5% of what's there. So to say you find the magic organisms, that doesn't mean we can grow it. That's a lot of work. Um, figure out how to do that. So there's a ton of, of research that can still be done. And I hope to do some of it. Yep. If you're interested and want to read this talk, I did a three-part series in Coral Magazine on this and goes a little bit deeper, you know, and better graphics than mine and things like that. And we we'll, we can put a link, right, Hillary, where they can click and download this? Yes, I believe I so. Have, I have permission, um, even yeah. though it was my article. It's copyrighted. But, yep, I have a PDF. And um, it's, a, like I said, accompanied by nice pictures and some graphs and different things like that. So um, we'll, we'll have a link and you can download uh, a written part of this. All right, everybody. Uh, hope you enjoyed this special edition of the Dr. Tim's Aquatics podcast with Dr. Tim doing most of the yakking and Hillary being very attentive and quiet this time. Learning, learning. <laughs> learning. We're all learning. But um, you know, as I said, the, the purpose of this was to show that microbiology is can be really fun and exciting, and there's lots to discover. And uh, they are a very diverse group of organisms, and uh, aquariums can lead that research. So if you uh, like this, if you didn't like this, please leave us a comment because we do pay attention and we do read these and appreciate uh, everyone. So. Thank you very much. And until next time, this has been Dr. Tim and Hillary with Dr. Tim's Aquatics Podcast.